The prophet proclaims, is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Friends, welcome to Bryn Mawr Presbyterian Church as we gather to worship the one who sets us free, who breaks every yoke that holds us back. We are thankful to have you with us this morning in person and online to worship Almighty God together. If you are here for the first time, please know you are especially welcome. We encourage you to fill out one of the visitor cards in the pew rack in front of you and place it in the offering plate later in this morning's service. If there is anything we might do to make our church home into your church home or a place for you in a time of need, please do not hesitate to let us know. I draw your attention to the bulletin to highlight a few announcements. Following worship this morning, you are invited to adult education in Fullerton Room, where the Reverend Rebecca Kirkpatrick will, will review the most recent PCUSA advocacy statements on contemporary issues such as gun violence, racism, anti-Semitism, gender, and environmental justice. The class will consider both the significance of each statement as well as what they call us to do and say as Presbyterians in the world today. All are welcome. Today at 5 p.m., you are invited back to the sanctuary for a multi-generational worship service at which we will celebrate the sacrament of communion and hear a message from the Reverend Dr. Agnes Norfleet. The service is especially designed to be a place for everyone to worship together. If you have not been before, I especially encourage you to come and experience this sacred time together. Next Sunday is Youth Sunday, during which our youth will lead all facets of the morning worship service. It is also the Super Bowl of Caring, a day to offer financial and non-perishable donations as part of a nationwide initiative to support those who are hungry. As you leave worship this morning, fourth and fifth graders will be at the door with grocery bags that include a list of needed food donations. You are encouraged to take a bag, fill it up with the items listed, and bring it back to worship next week. While there is so much happening in the life of this community, we come to this time focused on the worship of God. As you are able, would you please stand and join in our responsive call to worship. From the very beginning, God calls us. God sets us apart with a meaning and a purpose. Our hope is in God all of our lives. God is our refuge, a fortress against all that threatens us. In love, God saves and supports us. Trusting in God, we continually offer our praise.
Please be seated. Jesus tells us that we are the salt of the earth, we are the light of the world, but often we settle for being salt that has lost its taste and are content to have our light hidden under a basket. Acknowledging the ways we fail to be salt and light in this world, let us confess our sin together using the words of the printed prayer of confession. Holy God, you sent your Son to be the light of the world so that all may know the brightness of your love. But we have failed to draw others to your light. We have worshipped you with our lips, but have dishonored you with our actions. You have called us to be the salt of the earth, but we have not spread your love with compassion and generosity toward others. Forgive our self-righteousness and give us integrity of heart that we may bear witness to his light and serve your coming reign. Amen. Friends, your sins are forgiven by the faith of Christ, who believes in you and calls you to let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God in heaven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, as we welcome new sisters in Christ through baptism, I'm happy to be joined by Elder Flo Zeller, representing the session, and Emma Armstrong, representing the children of our congregation. Obeying the word of our Lord and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us, offering us a history, a heritage, a covenant. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ through his humanity and in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the body of Christ, the church, and joined to Christ's ministry of justice, peace, reconciliation, and love. So I'm glad that all of you, the children of our church, have a front row, a front row view of these baptisms to help all of us. Jesus said, let the little children come unto me and forbid them not, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we welcome Therese and Annie and celebrate this sacrament. Representing the congregation, it is my honor to present for the sacrament of baptism, Therese Jennings Bachman, daughter of Megan and Graham Bachman, sister to Graham and Anne Dorothy Ryan, daughter of Courtney and Andy Ryan. Choosing to present your children for baptism, as parents, you affirm your commitment to share the good news of God's love with them and to raise them in the family of Christ Church. So I ask you, do you confess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and do you promise in dependence on the grace of God to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith? to Therese and Anne, do you? Yeah. You are not alone in this task. Surrounding you is a community to help you keep this promise. Friends and family have joined you and will help nurture your children and walk with them on their Christian journey. So I ask these friends and family to please stand. 
And do you promise, through prayer and example, to support and to encourage, to love and to nurture Anne and Therese? If you so promise, will you say together, we do? You may be seated. Do we, the children of Bryn Mawr Presbyterian Church, promise to be a friend to Therese and Anne as they grow up in our church? If they need directions, will we show them the way? Will we play with them and share the stories of Jesus with them? Will we help them when they need help? If you promise to do these things, let us say we will. Will we? To the congregation, do we as members of the Church of Jesus Christ promise to guide and nurture Therese and Anne by word and deed with love and prayer encourage them to know and to follow Christ and to be faithful members of Christ's church. Do we? We do. Just imagine that I have a helper up here with me. Listen and see as the water is poured out. Ordinary no more. It is set aside in this moment as a sign of welcome, a sign of grace, a sign of new life, a sign of God's eternal promise. Let us pray. Holy God, may you, may you be present at this font. May you stir these waters with your spirit and rest in the heart of these children you claim. May this water be a sign and seal of your covenant that Anne and Therese may find joy and freedom to grow in grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. What is the name of your child? Anne Dorothy. Anne Dorothy. Dorothy, child of God and child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Come, O Holy Spirit, and rest on this your child that she may know the joy of your presence as you walk with her all of her days. Amen. And what is the name of your child? Therese Jennings. Therese. Oh my goodness. Come here. Oh, yes, I know. Therese Jennings, child of God and child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Come, O Holy Spirit, and rest upon this your child, that she may know the joy of your presence as you walk with her all of her days. Amen. On behalf of the children of Bryn Mawr Presbyterian Church, I would like to present these children's Bibles to you on the day of your baptism. May these stories help you grow in faith and in love. And I receive this blessing for you, little ones, Jesus Christ came into the world. For you, he lived and loved others. For you, he suffered death and was raised to new life. All this he did for you, Annie, and for you, Therese, though you do not know it yet. But we will continue to tell you this good news until it becomes your own. Proclaiming the truth of the gospel, we love because God first loved us. Therese and Anne are now received into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Through baptism, they have been made members of the household of God. I charge you, the witnesses of this baptism, to nurture them, to love them, and to share the good news of the gospel with them, and to help them know and follow Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Holy God, your blessings are abundant and your wisdom exceeds our grasp. Fill us with your spirit as we hear your word this day, that we may be justice seekers and peacemakers, sharing your life among those who are forgotten, weak or persecuted, and revealing to all your glory. Amen. Our first reading today comes from the prophet Isaiah. Listen for the word of the Lord. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interests on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is this not the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in.
Jesus has begun the Sermon on the Mount. Immediately after the blessings of the Beatitudes from the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Salt and light, two ingredients so much a part of our daily existence, we hardly think about them. Most of us don't think about salt too much unless the doctor has told you to reduce your intake. And light, we trust the sun to rise and set and rise again. And with a flip of a switch, we have light whenever and wherever we need it. You are the salt of the earth, Jesus says. And yet we have assimilated this uncommon saying into such a common turn of phrase. We uh, We describe the simple goodness of others, saying things like, I can't wait for you to meet these friends of ours. They are just the salt of the earth. However... When Jesus says emphatically, you are the salt of the earth, let's think more deeply about what being salt signifies. We know that salt has many purposes, to flavor food, create traction on icy roads, and it can serve as an antiseptic in wounds. But when Jesus tells his disciples to be salt, he is drawing on a number of Old Testament uses for salt. Look salt up in the Bible and you will discover that salt was used for seasoning food. It was also used in court to ratify covenants and used by priests in worship as a symbol of purification. To eat salt with someone signified a bond of loyalty and friendship. In rabbinic metaphorical language, salt connotes wisdom. One might not think there would be so much to learn about salt, but apparently there is. Michael Kalansky wrote a book entitled Salt, A World History by tracing how wars were won and lost on the basis of who controlled stores of salt. So necessary for the preservation of food, governors of empires found salt to be a lucrative means of raising money by controlling and taxing it. Indeed, salt was often a currency for commerce. As a matter of fact, Workers had to be paid enough so that they could buy salt. Hence the word salary 
derives its meaning from the Latin root for salt. So when you get your paycheck or draw from your retirement fund, be grateful that you have enough money to buy salt. And maybe that will help you remember salt's deeper, more profound meaning when the word comes off the lips of Jesus. Today, salt is cheap, but in the time of Jesus, it was valuable, precious, necessary to preserve food and thereby provide for human welfare and its medicinal properties for healing. When Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, what he is saying is, you are valuable. You are precious and necessary for human welfare and healing. This mineral mined of the earth and collected from the seas is vital to every living thing. That's who you are, Jesus tells us. So if salt is the earthbound, life-giving part of our nature, what is light? Throughout the Bible, light is almost always associated with the presence of God. At the beginning, on the first day of creation, God said, let there be light. At the end, in the book of Revelation, John saw the city had no need of sun or moon to shine, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb of God. And in almost every reference between Genesis and Revelation, light reveals the presence of of God. Throughout the Psalms, you know, and everywhere in the prophets, we find references to God as our light and our salvation. A light to those who sit in darkness, and the word of God, a lamp and light unto our path. According to Isaiah in our reading this morning, When we loose the bounds of injustice, let the oppressed go free, share our bread with the hungry, and house the homeless poor, the prophet says our light will break forth like the dawn. Therefore, When Jesus says, you are the light of the world, he is saying, you are of God. You are bearers of God's light, God's love, God's justice, mercy, and peace. And when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, he is saying, you are valuable, precious, necessary. You are essential for the life of others. Imagine, just imagine, what our world would look like today if every day we consciously saw in the mirror this reflection of God's light in our faces. Imagine, just Imagine what our world would look like if we saw in one another the precious, valuable, essential nature of salt. I am inclined to think fewer people would be beaten to death in our city's streets by those whose job it is to keep us safe. Fewer people would be separated out and cast off by the color of their skin. Fewer people would try to address their lonely isolation by plowing down a mass of strangers with an assault rifle in a school or grocery store 
or festival gathering. If everyone measured human worth by what Jesus is saying when he calls us salt and light, perhaps fewer people would be suffering from tragically low self-esteem and despair. Just last month, the National Bureau of Economic Research published a paper entitled Deaths of Despair and the Decline of American Religion, co-authored by scholars from Wellesley, Ohio State, and Notre Dame, the paper uses a wide range of research that correlates the decline of institutional religion with rising rates of deaths of despair, deaths to drug overdoses, alcohol abuse, and rapidly escalating rate of suicide. The research shows that the social factors of organized religion can play an important role in addressing the crisis of increasing deaths of despair. They write, the impact that we witness seems to be driven by the decline in formal religious participation rather than in belief or personal activities like prayer. These results underscore the importance of cultural institutions such as religious establishments in promoting well-being. In other words, those who are spiritual but not religious folks that we read about all the time are not getting the health and the mental health benefits of a community where we worship and work together as salt and light. David French, commenting on this research for The Atlantic, wrote, The authors reject single causal explanations for deaths of despair. Of course, there are many reasons people slide into addiction or take their own life. But it is not remotely surprising to me, French says, that despair can be tied to declining church attendance. It's hard to think of an institution that can better provide hope and purpose than a well-functioning church. The lessons of the church, he adds, provide a combination of eternal and temporal assurance of God's loving nature That doesn't mean Christianity can't be incredibly demanding, but a demanding life is a purposeful life. In a good church, synagogue, or mosque, there is a place for every kind of people, a role for each member of the community, in a symphony of service. If we love and serve our neighbors, he concludes, we can do something tangible to repair our national fabric and perhaps even help save the lives of lonely and despairing people all around us. Now you could argue that I'm preaching to the choir, so to speak, talking about the value of the church to people inside the sanctuary at this moment. But I also happen to know that many of us in here are in deep despair over what's going on in our country and in our world and how we often leave and head out to our daily routines without knowing how to shine God's light in a broken world so full of violence and cruelty and fear-mongering. There's a lot of pressure on us to take sides, to stay in entrenched clubs with like-minded people, to hold the overwhelming 
problems at bay. However, we are called by Christ not to retreat, but to shine God's light so that others are drawn to it. Last November, there was a story in the news about a seventh grader from Buffalo, New York, named Romello Early, who watched with distress as one of his classmates, Melvin Anderson, was picked on because of the shoes he was wearing. In middle school, having expensive sneakers is often a status symbol, and as one teacher noted, you go to school and people look at your shoes before they even look at your face. Like a lot of other pressures we endure, it should not be that way, but often it is. Melvin was teased for wearing worn-out shoes, and as he lamented, it felt bad. How many times have we heard stories about the effects of this kind of bullying behavior? And when we put up with a bullying behavior in the top echelons of political and cultural life, how do we expect 12-year-olds not to engage in demeaning forms of teasing? How often does such bullying lead to something much worse? But Romello early decided to put an end to it. Deeply bothered by seeing Melvin being bullied this way, Romello went home and told his mother, Mom, you can take away anything you're getting me for Christmas, and you can take away my allowance, but I want to buy Melvin some shoes. So, Romello worked with his mother to pull together $135, basically his life savings, so that he could get Melvin some new shoes. With the wisdom of a salty, light-bearing child, Romello said nobody deserves to be put down based on a pair of shoes that he's going to eventually grow out of. He went on to say his next goal is to convince his fellow classmates that shoes were made for walking, not dividing and diminishing. One pair of shoes broke the cycle of bullying that so often escalates into something much worse. One pair of shoes that lifted Melvin from the far end of bullying to a place of fuller humanity among his peers, all through the care of a 12-year-old who values human community more than his own Christmas presents or all the money he had saved. Their teacher says now she is confident Romello's kind actions have become contagious among their peers. Salt and light, valuable, necessary, precious, we are essential to the life of others, Jesus says. You are the light of the world when you loose the bonds of injustice. Let the oppressed go free. Share our bread with the hungry and house the homeless poor. Our light will break forth like the dawn. So wherever you are, be salt of the earth and let your light shine. Amen.
Having heard the word of God read and proclaimed, let us remain standing as we affirm what it is we believe by sharing together in the words of our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us turn our hearts now to God in prayer. Like that old English poet John Donne, we pray, batter our hearts, three-person God. For you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that we may rise and stand. Overthrow us and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make us new. Holy One, we lift our hearts to you in this moment, though our heads are bowed. We pause in the sanctity of this space, in the hallowing of this hour, to utter our thanksgiving and our lament. Would that you hear us and bring your spirit here. You have called us to be servants in and for the world, to be salt and light in a time where bitterness and darkness seem so pervasive. We pray for the world, torn as it is by conflict and divisions. We have learned war very well. Now teach us the more difficult way of peace. You have called us to be stewards of creation, to give thanks for its beauty, its immensity, and its intricate details, and not only to give thanks, but to protect it. We pray that we might live in ways that are responsible, so that when evening comes, we might have left this good earth better than we found it. You've called us to be stewards of your divine mysteries, not settling for easy answers, boxing you in by the limits of our knowledge and imagination. Make us more faithful in this. Strengthen us to proclaim with joy the good news of the gospel, but also quiet us. Quiet us enough to hear your mysteries proclaimed by those voices who have been long silenced. As you love us, so you call us to love one another. In love, we pray for people in need, for those who are sick and carrying heavy burdens, for those who are bent low by anguish and grief, for the one who feels a stranger in our community, for the one filled with worry over a job, a relationship, a decision to be made. Meet each one of them in their need, we pray, with healing, comfort, communion, and hope. Be with us in what we offer to you this day, that as a light that cannot be hidden, we might discover the courage to live as answers to these prayers. We pray in the name of the wounded one who makes all of us whole, Jesus our Lord sharing in the words he taught his disciples when we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Following our prayers and affirmations, we commit again to the work of discipleship. We renew ourselves to the task of following Jesus Christ in this broken and achingly beautiful world God so loves. One way we do that is by the sharing of our gifts. May what we offer this day be given with the assurance that acts of generosity are always acts of discipleship. As we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings, we encourage you to find the friendship pad located towards the center aisle at the end of your pews, to fill it out and pass it down and back so that we might know the names of those with whom we worship.
Loving God, we give thanks for all you have given to us and praise you for your astounding goodness. Receive the dedication of our hearts, minds, and bodies for the ministry of your church. Bless our offering for the work of your kingdom and give us wisdom for the right use of all you have provided. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Go now into the world in peace. Go as salt of the earth and light of the world. As you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and all those you love, and all God's children everywhere this day and forevermore. Amen.